Let's begin by bringing you updates on the building collapse in Abuja. The Federal Capital Territory Administration, FCTA, through the Emergency Management Department, has revealed that a tragic building collapse in Gidash Estate, Sabon Lugbe area on the airport road in Abuja has claimed the lives of seven persons. The body, FEMD, also dismissed media claims that 40 people were trapped beneath the rubble of the structure after the building collapsed. News Central's Amadin Oye reports that the FCT authorities had previously demolished the building as it was said to be located in an illegally acquired area. He explained that scavengers were at the site of the demolished building to retrieve scrap metal, which then led to the compromise of the structure and its resulting secondary collapse. The acting director general of FEMD, Abdurrahman Mohammed, while speaking on the incident at the site, said that those who died were scavenging for iron rods and other materials when the building collapsed. Earlier, our Abuja Bureau Chief gave more update on this. This is the exact spot where it occurred. Uh, if you come this way, camera, look at you see uh, there's a, a tape uh, restricting people into this environment. But here I'm standing at the exact location. What eventually happened was that there is a demolition exercise ongoing at this estate. You see uh, debris of uh, uh, the, the remnants of the building. If you also follow me once again, uh, camera, you can pan that way. You see a bulldozer somewhere down there pulling down structures. Uh, so what exactly happened was that as the demolition exercise happened here, part of this building was pulled down. And after part of this building had been pulled down, scavengers came on to see what they could scavenge from the building here. Uh, the remnants of the building now collapsed. Uh, three people died on the spot. About 11 were injured after the rescue operation. Then one other scavenger who had climbed another building to scavenge fell from that building, hitting his head on the floor. So we had uh, 15 victims, four dead with 11 injured. Let's also tell you that the Lagos Blue Line Rail has resumed after a fire outbreak on a section of its track on Saturday. Boyega Akoshile. Spokesperson for Babajide Sonwolu, governor of Lagos State, said the fire occurred at 4.12 p.m. on Saturday. He added that the incident was a minor one and that no casualties were recorded because the train was not operating at the time. In a statement shortly after the incident, the Lagos Metropolitan Area Transport Authority, Lamata, said engineers were working to replace the burnt cables. On Sunday, Jibril Gawat, Senior Special Assistant on New Media to Lagos State Governor posted a clip of a blue train running through the tracks. Away from that, the Inspector General of Police, Kayode Egbetokun, has expressed his pleasure over the confrontation between police officers and operatives of the Nigeria Security and Civil Defense Corps in Oshogbo, the Oshun State Capital. An NSCDC officer, identified simply as Oweye, Reportedly assaulted, was reportedly assaulted while on guard duty in an estate and subsequently detained by the police. The incident was said to have caused a dispute between the Oshun Command of NSCDC and the Nigeria Police Force. The Oshun State Government later held a meeting with security heads to resolve the rift. However, the IG in a statement released by Force Spokesperson Muyuwa Adejobi described the confrontation as unprofessional and directed the Assistant Inspector General of Police in charge of Zone 11, Oshobo, to conduct a discreet investigation into the root cause of the incident. Families of identified slain police officers in the southeast have received relief materials from a group after the security men were said to have lost their lives to attacks by gunmen while on their duty posts in different states in the region. News Central's Chiwe Ugele reports that the presentation of the items to Abia State victims was donated by was done at the police headquarters in Umwaya in the presence of the Commissioner of Police. 
Most times, the sudden death of a security male spouse leaves the wife empty, vulnerable, and helpless. I lose my husband 217 on 20th of April 217. Husband, even now, I'm not feeling fine. And then I tried to manage with my life. I'm a businesswoman, but I don't get anything to help myself to do any business. Now. No matter how prepared they seem for the worst to happen in the line of duty, their families still never get over it because of the gap their demise creates in the home. When you are in that painful place, one thing that should give you joy is to smile to say he paid the ultimate price. It is for this reason that the Peace Fund, an offshoot of the Peace in the Southeast project, which has the Deputy Speaker Ben Carlo as the founder is intervening through provision of cash and foodstuff to these women whose husbands were once police officers in Abia State. All we want to do is to see you happy. You, All we want to do is to see you smile. Yes, you All we want to do is to see you have hope that you are not alone, <laughs> that your life is not only dependent on the only what police can give you. The Commissioner of Police, Daladi Isa, expresses joy at the gesture. We will do everything humanly possible to also encourage our Lapua uh, on our own part. This is also a catalyst. Uh, to what we are going to do. The essence of this act of charity is to restore hope in the lives of the families that are left behind and encourage those in active service to keep going. Uh, May 30th uh, this year, uh, uh, soldiers were slain in Aba uh, by uh, some non-state actors and the deputy speaker came, visited the Asa uh, military base and then by the time we came back, he decided that it should not be one of that we should set up a peace fund so that we can be supporting victims of insecurity in the southeast and even all over uh, the country. So he inaugurated a seven-man committee to raise funds from well-meaning Nigerians and then to identify uh, victims of insecurity, families of policemen, soldiers, all the security agencies, and extend succor and support to them. The beneficiaries are thinking that such a community is extended to them. I say, may God bless the all of us in Jesus' name. Anything when they want to do for us, God must be a blessing. The initiative targets families of security men and women in the Southeast and even beyond, who constantly are challenged by men of the underworld as a way of enthroning peace. In Omar Hefony Central, I am Chinwe Ugele. And now to politics, where the Kano Independent Electoral Commission has issued certificates of return to the newly elected 44 local government chairmen across the state. The certificates were issued by the commission's chairman, Professor Sani Malamfashi, on Sunday. Malamfashi noted that the commission has the mandate to issue the certificate and urged the newly elected local government chairmen and councillors to discharge their duties effectively. The report also stated that the state governor, Abba Yusuf, will soon swear in the chairman at Government House in Kano State. The State Electoral Commission had declared the new Nigeria People's Party the winner of all 44 chairmanship positions and the 484 councillorship positions in Saturday's local government election in the state. And to unpack this, we're joined by political analyst Ismail Awal. Good afternoon. Glad to have you join me on the news. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. All right. I mean, did this uh, result of the election uh, come to you as a surprise or not? Well, actually, for me, it was not a surprise uh, because, uh, you see, one, it has become a practice in Nigeria that in every state that the ruling, the ruling party will sweep all the councillorship and terms of election. It is one. So it has become a practice for the past four, eight years. And secondly, it's uh, the chairman of the state electoral commission, Professor Sazima Long, and she just a day before the election announced that there are only, three, there are only six parties joining the election. Of course, APC, El Progressive Congress, excluded. And there's no way any of those since the five parties can beat any of the people in So actually, for me, it's not a surprise. 
Mm. But what then would this mean for a state like Kano State, uh, looking at how NNPP swept all the seats, holding all local government positions in Kano State? Well, actually, what it means, it actually depends on the angle you are looking at. One, uh, if you are looking at the angle of democracy, whether it's the NNP in Kano, whether it's PDP elsewhere, whether it's uh, APC elsewhere, for me, I've always viewed this as very, very undemocratic because I actually don't see a way whereby a political party, whether NNP, whether APC, whether PDP, to sweep all electoral positions in the states, for me, it's actually impossible, and it is very, very undemocratic. Mm. And when you look at uh, maybe how this local government chairman has been functioning, uh, I also believe most of them are going to be uh, subservient or, or let, let me say, answerable to the governor or whoever gives them the ticket to. But it, it's very, very clear. This is a clear. Uh, a clear instance of, of installment actually from the not, not, not election. Because you have only one minute to start contesting an election. Let's come into an election. Because you give a people or the, the residents of a particular street the option to choose. So we are only presented with one option. Ultimately, it's going to be. Hmm. Well, if you, yeah, just to follow, you know, what you have shared in line of what you have expressed, uh, do you think there'll be room for accountability and also transparency for these elected officials now as they resume office? Uh, I mean, what should be the yardstick or metrics for performance for them? No, no, there wouldn't be, there wouldn't be any, 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 any transparency or accountability in any government that is formed uh, as his chairman. From the case, just like I mentioned, they knew that they become they, they, they became chairman not because not because people elected them. No, they knew that they are only chairman because their principles want them to the chairman, and they actually so there is not going to be uh, any form of transparency and accountability. And for metrics, I think for me in a situation like this, a metrics what will determine whether someone is performing or not it depends on largely how. Now, I mean, looking ahead now, uh, what do you think are the lessons in hindsight uh, regarding uh, when it comes to voter engagement and also wider participation in local governance in Nigeria? Well, actually, people are going to lose trust and confidence in the system. That's what is going to happen because even if you look at uh, what happened in just recent yesterday election, um, Many people didn't go out to vote. I know people want to want, want to portray that uh, they, they are massive student out there, but you need to really look at the numbers and if you really look at look at the people on the on ground. You, you definitely know that people don't trust the process. Many people stay at home, so there is very very negligible like, participation in the process, and that's very dangerous. But in course. Hmm. Well, thank you so much for your thoughts on the news, Ismail Awal. Political analyst, many thanks indeed. We'll take, a we'll take a short break. When we return, Senator Ndume asks President Chinobu to sack more ministers. Details shortly. Join us again. Thank you for staying tuned. The senator representing Bronu South, Ali Ndume, has asked President Bola Chinobu to sack more ministers who are underperforming to first track the implementation of his renewed hope agenda for the country. In a statement in Abuja, Ndume described the rejigging of the federal cabinet and the establishment of the Ministry of Regional Development to oversee all regional commissions in the country as a welcome development. President Shinobu had on Wednesday reshuffled his cabinet by sacking six ministers and naming seven others. The president also swapped the portfolios of ten other ministers. Ndume, former chief whip of the Senate, also called on President Chinobu to convene a national economic summit as part of efforts to profile homegrown solution to the economic state of the country. Former Vice President and Presidential Candidate of the PDP, Atiku Abubakar, has observed the ongoing electricity crisis in Nigeria has been high and reached critical levels, particularly affecting the southeast, northwest and northeast region, which have faced complete blackouts for, th for the past three weeks. The former vice president called for immediate government intervention to restore power in the distressed areas. 
Article highlighted the necessity for the government's agencies responsible for electricity to act swiftly, emphasizing that the current situation demands urgent measures to alleviate the suffering of affected citizens. He reiterated his belief that his policy proposal offers a comprehensive plan to address the nation's long-standing in energy challenges. Consignment of opioids concealed in soles of shoes and hair attachments heading to United States, United Kingdom and Cyprus have been intercepted by operatives of the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, NDLEA, at the Maritala Mohammed International Airport's NMIA Ikeja Lagos and three courier companies in the state. A total of 2,118 pills of tramadol concealed and soles of 13 pairs of shoes going to Cyprus were seized at the export shed of Lagos Airport on 12 October 2024. An additional 380 tablets recovered from the home of the sender, Okenwa Kelvin Uchena, during a follow-up operation in Enugu on Thursday, 24th October. The cash of 968,880 naira and a total a Toyota Avalon car marked UWN 389AS were also recovered from the suspect at the time of his arrest. Nigeria's federal government says that it has commenced the process of nationalizing cartoon concerns in the country to help rebrand the nation's public image and inculcate the virtue of patriotism among citizens. Nigeria's Minister of Information and National Orientation made us known at the launch of the Unveiling and Rebrand Nigeria Initiative, which held in the nation's capital, Abuja. Our correspondent, Imano Bogudo, has details. Nigerian children singing songs of unity, hope and patriotism at the unveiling a rebranding Nigeria initiative conference which held at the nation's capital, Abuja. Nigeria, Nigeria. Themed Rise Up Patriot, it's a gathering of reputable statesmen proven with integrity who appeal to the consciousness of their fellow countrymen to be positive and project admirable characters that will give Nigeria a good name in the international community. That if you realize what Nigeria is as a country, it is not difficult to love Nigeria because many people love to hate Nigeria. Why? Because Nigeria, Nigeria is something else. Nigeria cannot be stopped. In spite of our problems, in spite of everything, Nigeria is still standing. What that means is, as for, for the last 10 years, we want to raise the content produced here in cartoons about us, about our values, about our tradition and culture, to at least 70% of the content our children are consuming. So that means there will be a lot of investment into animation. So on the start of first, sorry, that year start of first of, I mean of October and first of November in Lagos, there is a festival of animation, you know, creators. Twenty-six countries are participating, so we will be there. A patriot should be a fully rounded citizen. You know, you must respect your heritage. You must take pride in your uh, history and uh, uh, culture. But you must also be a citizen that obeys the laws, a citizen that votes, because if you don't vote, you are already uh, 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 creating the condition for reckless people to get into positions, public positions of responsibility, you know, and to create more problems rather to solve fundamental needs and aspirations of the citizens. A former Nigeria International Olympic gold medalist, Emmanuel Babanyaru, frowned at the negligence in the use of sports to promote patriotism to project a positive image for the country. And whenever we're on the pitch, it's not just us playing. We're representing over 200 million people. You see, that patriotism is being planted, implanted into your head. It's called orientation. And that's why you see the average sports person is naturally very patriotic, irrespective of what he or she is going through. You understand? You've never had, you've never had an athlete ever, no matter the, the, no matter his or her complaint, saying, "Oh, I regret representing Nigeria." It never happens. The Rebrand Nigeria Initiative is expected to change this negative perception to a positive one. In Abuja for New Central, I am Emmanuel Bagudu. In a dazzling ceremony held on Saturday in Lagos. 
The annual Brandcom Award celebrated excellence in brand communication and marketing. The event, attended by industry leaders, creative minds and influencers, showcased innovative campaigns and highlighted outstanding contributions to the marketing sector. It was a night filled with glamour and African opulence, to the awards hosted in the heart of Lagos. A keynote speech was given by the convener of Brandcom Awards, Joshua Ajayi, who emphasized the importance of adaptability in the fast-evolving landscape of brand communication. Tonight, we celebrate the 35 under 35, the brightest stars in the Nigeria's marketing and communication industry. These talented professionals have not only mastered our, their craft, but have also demonstrated an innovative spirit that combines creativity with technology to deliver outstanding results. Among the evening's big winners, New Central Television took home the coveted Fast Rising News Channel of the Year Award, recognized for its impactful programs and fearless reporting. Into 2024, New Central's commitment to delivering timely and relevant news, its innovative program, and its focus on engaging audiences through multiple platforms and positioned it as a credible player in the media industry. The night also featured a star-studded lineup of activities that kept guests entertained throughout the night. We have been fearlessly reporting on what matters most, and this has given us the deserved attention. Um, as you can see tonight, this is a well-deserved award. Well, we intend to be the forefront and center um, of everything happening, both not just Nigeria, but at Africa at large. That is the goal for us. Um, from our studies, over the period, yes, the times are hard, but so many of them have been very creative and they worked doubly hard and you'll be surprised at the result they have. So, yes, it's tough, but um, the creative ones will always excel. The Brandcom Awards not only recognizes excellence, but also fosters collaboration and innovation within the industry contributing immensely to the growth of the industry and the country at large. In Lagos, for New Central, I'm Bettina Nwili. Thank you for staying with us. The death toll following a few tank explosion near the Ugandan capital, Kampala, last week has risen to 24. The East African country has witnessed several similar disasters in recent years, with people rushing to scoop few from tankers involved in road accidents. Communications Minister Godfrey Kabianga said since some of the dead were burnt beyond recognition, the police have been working tirelessly to identify the deceased through DNA testing. The tanker had left the capital for Gulu in northern Uganda, a journey of some 650 kilometers, but it's overturned and bursts into flames and route. The driver is still at large, according to the government. Prominent Kenyan human rights activist Boniface Mwagi has been detained by police after six mass individuals forcibly took him from his home on charges of exciting violence. His detention comes after he called for an anti-government protest at a marathon in the capital Nairobi on Sunday. Police spokesperson Resila Onyango confirmed to local media that Mwangi was in custody but did not provide further details. Mwangi's detention has caused outrage among supporters who are demanding his release. A senior UN official in Sudan says she is deeply troubled by reports of atrocious crimes in the central Jazeera state, including the mass killing of civilians by the Paramilitary Rapid Support Forces RSF. Clementine Nkweta Salami's comments came after an activist group said at least 124 people were killed by the RSF in attacks on villages over the past week. The RSF has denied targeting civilians, saying its fighters are clashing with militias armed by the military. The 18-month conflict in Sudan has killed tens of thousands of people and displaced more than 11 million people. 
Supporters of Botswana's opposition party, the Umbrella for Democratic Change, UDC, rallying Gaborun for its presidential candidate, Duma Boko, ahead of the upcoming general election. The Southern African country will hold general elections October 30. Botswana's president, Masisi, confronts his arch rival at next week's election, but a real economic enemy may be elsewhere. Earlier, the Southern African Development Community, SADAC, officially launched its mission with a call for peaceful elections. <laughs> Tenderness. Former Uruguayan President Jose Pepe Mujica casts votes in the country's presidential election in which a left-wing history teacher is tipped to win power after five years of center-right rule. Polls show security topping the consents of voters in the tiny country of 3.4 million people, which has faced an increase in drug-related violence in recent years. Mujika, who is undergoing cancer treatment, remains actively involved in politics, but says at a polling station it may be his last vote. Mañana capaz que eh, reacción, pero por ahora hay más pobre que antes. Georgians have reacted to parliamentary election results, which the Electoral Commission say the ruling party, Georgian Dream, won with 54.08% of the vote against 37.58% for pro-European opposition coalition which disputes the results and refuses to concede defeat. Reactions are divided between Georgians who want to either keep protesting or leave the country, while a supporter of the Georgian dream says the country needs to have relations with Russia, whether it likes it or not. Obviously, the Georgian dream has stolen the elections. Uh, the final results are, uh, I don't know, ridiculous. Uh, I don't know, I think everyone is thinking about... Uh, two versions either to um, like keep protesting and protesting or just like like Belarusians did like leave this country and uh, start a new life somewhere else uh, they, they are not promising uh, in my point of view because our European aspirations and uh, moving towards the West will be under big question now despite that uh, the ruling party says that they will manage everything, so we don't believe it. Uh, but of course, we will defend our uh, historical and uh, will of uh, more than 80% of people who wants to join the European Union and who wants to become member of this uh, big family. And uh, I, I think all the, uh, we should take all the measures to... Former U.S. First Lady Mitchell Obama has aired her genuine fear that presidential candidate Donald Trump could retake the White House as a popular former First Lady made a passionate appeal to voters in a desperately close U.S. election. 
Both Trump and Kamala Harris were in Michigan searching for holdout votes ahead of the November 5 election, with Harris focused on the abortion right and Trump returning to his anti-immigrant campaign theme. Obama said Democratic candidates Harris would be an extraordinary president of the United States if elected in just 10 days. But with polls forecasting a virtual dead heat, she also spoke of a sense of frustration and anxiety that few on Harris's team dare express after she lost the momentum in recent weeks. This is a big country, and that's why all of my hope about Kamala is also accompanied by some genuine fear. Fear for our country, fear for our children, Fear for what is coming our way if we forget the stakes in this election. And y'all, that's why I'm here today. And y'all know I hate politics. <laughs> but I hate to see folks taken advantage of even more. So I hope you'll forgive me if I'm a little frustrated that some of us are choosing to ignore Donald Trump's gross incompetence while asking Kamala to dazzle us at every turn. I, I hope that you'll forgive me if I'm a little angry that we are indifferent to his erratic behavior, his obvious mental decline, his history as a convicted felon, a known, a known slumlord, a predator found liable for sexual abuse, all of this, while we pick apart Kamala's answers from interviews that he doesn't even have the courage to do, y'all. Women have died because of these bans. How could anybody say that they wanted this? And you have heard me say, I do believe Donald Trump to be an unserious man. But the consequences of him ever being president again are brutally serious. Brutally serious. Venezuela's President Nicolas Maduro has vowed that his country would not be silenced after Brazil vetoed its bid to join the BRICS group of emerging economies. The South American country is in a mix of an unprecedented economic crisis, which the government says is a result of U.S. sanctions and has long sought to join the BRICS group. Venezuela reacted furiously to Brazil's veto at a summit in the Russian city of Kazan earlier this week, calling the decision a hostile act. The BRICS, which already included Brazil, Russia, India, South Africa and China as members, were joined in 2024 by Ethiopia, Iran, Egypt, and the United Arab Emirates. Hay quienes en el pasado, Diosdado, trataron de callar la voz de Venezuela. ¿Y qué pasó con los que trataron de callar nuestra voz? Se secaron, tan secos, desaparecieron del mapa de la historia, cayeron en el basural de la historia. Todo aquel que pretendió callar nuestra voz en el pasado, pasado. No existe fuerza en esta tierra, lo digo, que calle la voz de rebeldía y de justicia de Venezuela. Ni hoy, ni mañana, ni nunca. Nadie vetará ni callará Venezuela. A truck rammed into a bus stop north of the commercial hub Tel Aviv in Israel on Sunday, injuring dozens of people. The police did not immediately say what caused the incident or whether it was an attack. At least 16 people were initially transported to nearby hospitals, while multiple injuries were confirmed. The incident comes as Israel marks the Hebrew calendar anniversary of the unprecedented Hamas attack on October 7 last year that sparked the ongoing wars in Gaza and Lebanon. In sports, Nigeria's Oluwati Milen Hidoko has emerged as a champion of the 15th African Scrabble Championship 
triumphing over a competitive field of 92 players from 10 African countries in Kigali, Rwanda. Over four days, participants battled through 32 intense rounds, with Doko standing out by achieving 24 wins and only seven losses, securing the title with one game to spare. This victory not only crowns him as the new champion, succeeding his compatriot Enoch Onwali, but also awards him a prize of $5,000 reinforcing Nigeria's dominance in African Scrabble. Meanwhile, Nigeria's Ezino George claimed second place with a prize of $3,200, while Onoshe Wenobu rounded out the top three, earning $2,300. Serbia's auger Danilovic powered past American qualifier Caroline Dolhide 6-3, 6-1 in the final of the Gonzwahu Open on Sunday to seal her first trophy of the season and second overall. World number 86 Danilovic, whose previous triumph came on clay in Moscow six years ago, grabbed a break in the fifth game of the first set in her maiden hard courts final and overcame a late fight back from Dolhide to pull away. After wrapping up the opener with another break, the 23-year-old Seb bounced back from her struggles to build a 4-1 lead as Dolhide made several errors. Danilovic pulled her fatigued opponents till the end to win the second title in her career. And Manchester United endured another tough blow under manager Eric Ten Hag as Jared Bowen's stoppage time penalty seed a 2-1 victory for West Ham on Sunday. West Ham took the lead through Lucas Paqueta's goal in the 25th minute and despite a quick response from United's Casemiro, Bowen's late strike in the 92nd minute secured the win for the Hammers. This defeat says Manchester United slipped 14th in the Premier League table were just three wins from their opening nine games, while West Ham climbs to 13th position. Elsewhere, Chelsea edged out Newcastle with a 2-1 win, thanks to goal from Nicolas Jackson and Cole Palmer, while Crystal Palace also celebrated a victory over Tottenham. Ethiopia's Yomif Kalacha broke the men's world half marathon record in Valencia, clocking a time of 57 minutes 30 seconds to shave a single second off the previous mark. Kajolcha's sixth appearance over the distance, the 27 year old world indoor mile record holder took control of the race from the three kilometer mark. Kajolcha passed through five kilometer in 13 minutes 38 seconds. 10 kilometers in 27 minutes 12 seconds and 15 kilometers in 40 minutes 56 seconds when he broke away from Kenyan pair Daniel Mateko and Azaya Kipchua to secure victory and beat the world record set by Jacob Kim Limmo of Uganda and Lisbon three years ago. And that's all on the news. Let's take a look again at some of the major stories. Abuja authorities have confirmed seven dead blame scavengers for a building collapse. Senate, Senator Ndume has asked President Chinubu to sack more ministers. We also told you that death toll from Uganda tank explosion has risen to 24. You can watch New Central Live on DS TV, Channel 42. Star Times, Channel 274, Avo TV, and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I am Adebola Adedubel.